Hello, I'm Mike. Uh, <clears throat> I am on the board here of the Silver Sides, which is good. Uh, I also serve as your manager for the Department of Veterans Affairs for Muskegon County. And two weeks from now, the presentation that I'm going to give is about uh, the, the whole Army unit that's from here, from Michigan, that went in World War I and had uh, Lieutenant William J. Beal from Post 446 and uh, Alvin Yonker, Sergeant Alvin Yonker from EFW in Grand Haven. So we'll discuss those. And then if we don't have any other presenters, which we're trying to, then I'll also answer questions regarding the PACT Act that's up here right now that, that was just signed into law, uh, the Camp Lejeune stuff that you're being bombarded with on TV, and hopefully answer some questions for you regarding that. So uh, first one up today is Billy Stancroft, and he's gonna be representing uh, post 7729, and then following him, we'll have Lupe Alviar talking about the VBA. Thank you, Mike. Can anybody hear, everybody hear me without this? They all tell me I got a big mouth to talk too much anyway. Can you hear me? Okay, like you said, my, my name is Billy Stancroft. And uh, talk about VFW Post 7729, which if a lot of you know is located on Apple Avenue on Eggleston Township. You can't miss it, it's a big tank sitting by the road. The road commission gives me heck about all the time. <laughs> Okay, the post was named after a local Skeegan County resident, Lieutenant Clement F. Derziski. He was from the Eggleston area, was a doctor out there, and after the war started, he uh, joined the United States Navy and was assigned to a Marine Expeditionary Force in the Pacific, which you know the Marines don't have medics, they borrow them from the Navy all the time. Exact time of service up there, I do not know. I tried to find it out. I've heard stories about it for years. At one point of his service out there, he was working on a young soldier that had been injured quite severely. Well, it ended up the soldier was one of his previous patients from Muskegon. <laughs> he was Orville Thompson, which I knew knew quite well before his death. And uh, after the war, Lieutenant Clement M. Terzinski came back to Eggleston Township where he restarted his practice here in Muskegon and was quite instrumental in starting in the volunteer fire department at Eggleston and other things. You know, he worked real closely with a lot of the people in Eggleston Township. Then later on, he was working at Hackley Hospital with polio patients back in the 40s. Well, before that, let me back up a little bit. He did a lot of work with local veterans. And for the people I've talked to, that new family members and other articles I've found on the gentleman, veterans were either no charge or very little. His heart was with the veterans. After working with Hackley Hospital with polio patients, he came down with polio. Mm. In 1949, in August, he passed away at the age of 37. Mm -hmm. Later that year, Eggleston's Township finished building the first fire department, which at the time of the dedication, his wife was there and they dedicated the fire department in his name. Now, I have uh, one of his sons lives here in Muskegon. Jimmy Derzinski, he was a county commissioner. He was going to be here tonight, but he said other things come up and he wasn't able to make it. His other son lives down in Ann Arbor, I believe, yet. Both of them are life members of the VFW. And uh, we've had them around because we had a 50 year anniversary not too long ago. Okay, the VFW was mustered back in July 9, 1950. Four. 83 members started that VFW. At the time, there was two other ones in Muskegon, but, you know, everybody wanted their own little VFW, which was great after World War II. There was tons of veterans mm -hmm. from World War II in Muskegon area because of all the, you know, heavy manufacturing and everything else. My father was one of them. 
Okay, at the time they started, this happened to be the gentleman that he saved was one of the founding members. And from my article I found he insisted that the VFW would be named after Lieutenant Clement F. Derzinski, which it still is to the day. And it's, it's quite might well known in the VFW realm of Michigan. We tried to keep it up and me and myself, I'm all over the state with the VFW. We started out with a little house on Hilton Park Road. Then later, we moved to 6585 Apple Avenue, which is the post home now. We had two pieces of parcel donated to the thing. We had 12 acres out there. And in 1970, they built a large hall on it, 5,000 square feet. And to the day, the only bigger hall there is is the new convention center. You know, there was some bigger halls, but they have closed. But we've got 5,000 square feet and a beautiful. We've spent a lot of money on the last few years, retrofitting it and everything else. Right now, the post and auxiliary, for years, we get back on the hall. The hall was built by Bingo. Hmm. Near like it was 30 years ago, Bingo. <laughs> My mother passed away in 2001, before that, for 25 years. She did bingo at that VFW once or twice a week. And after my time with the active service, I moved back home, bought the house next door while mom and dad were getting a little mature, as I call it. I can't say old because I get yelled at all the time. But uh, so I moved in with them. So she'd come home, and I remember the first night of bingo, she'd come home and told me she they lost money. I said, well, that happens. Oh, no, it never happens. <laughs> but. Uh, with the property we had there, we had a lot of woods out back. In the 90s, we decided to clear that. We knew Cunningham and a few of the other members have been there for a while. So they clear cut the property out back. It just happened to be uh, somebody worked for the National Guard, full time technician. Well, at that time, they cut back our community service. So I got a hold of one of my people in Lansing. I told my the bulldozer we had to work on. So he allowed me to take it over and it ran for three days. I stopped cleaning up the rest of the property. Because I know my mother told me the next day I made a lot of people mad. I said, why? He said, every time you move that boat over, the bingo chips were moving out of the table. <laughs> Which, you know, I, I could see that. A lot of work on that place. The floor should have been a little thicker. But it's always been a community place for, for you know, the community. We do a lot of weddings, we do a lot of funerals, we do a lot of functions to support the school. Once a year for the last 18 years, we did a support the troops party in February. We have 10 bands fight over who's gonna play for an hour. We, the money we use from that, we help our veterans, we've helped the National Guard and every reserve that had deployed. In fact, my own unit out of Montague right now is in Kuwait. Mm. Everybody figures, you don't do that with the National Guard. Well, they have ever since 91 or, you know, the last war, so. <coughs> but we try to, you know, we have dinners a lot. In fact, we have one dinner once a month on Thursday. Starts at 1 o'clock. In partnership with Eggleston Township. We can bring up to 200 people, and it's all from Muskegon. Anybody over the age of 60 can sign up for this dinner. And your senior citizen millage pays for this dinner. We got a hold of them, and I said, you guys get all this money for all this renovation down in the Heights of Muskegon. How about us people out here, poor Eggleston Township, which I consider a retirement community. I'm from Moreland. Back in 1981, we started a dinner. We do first week of Wednesday, first Wednesday in December for seniors in Eggleston Township. It's a free dinner. All we request them to do is come in and bring canned goods. And Mike can testify, sometimes we have one or two vans with the, I mean, we, have, we collect thousands of canned goods, which goes to the West Michigan Vet Center. Back in 1981, the voter register for people over the age of 60 was 487, because I had the paperwork. I was looking at the one I'm ready to set it up for this year. There's 2,500 people at Eggleston Township over the age of 60 that are registered voters. So like I say, it is a retirement community. We, in, I should say, I invite, because I always catch heck. Why didn't you invite me? You only get invited about every four years. And 
to talk to a lot of them, you know, there's a lot of people 60, 70 years still working. Mm -hmm. That's what I consider. I mean, I retired at age 94 because of the complication of age in orange. That was a long time ago. Hmm. And here I am 75 and I'm still working, but I've been enjoying my job. Like I say, out back now we have two nice ball fields. We work with the local youth baseball, softball, and stuff like that there. We try to help the community and the schools. In fact, right now some of my ladies <laughs> auxiliary are looking over essays. That Oak Ridge, 71 kids wrote up one and a half pages of essays to enter context with the Vestures of Poor War support. Mm. We'll be sending four of them people to a district deal. And from district, they can go to state. We also have a, a Voice of Democracy where you do a vocal recording of what the different themes are each year. The top price on that is $35,000, which is given out in D.C. in March. We've been fortunate. We've had a couple state winners. We work with Oak Ridge, Orchard View, and Ravana. Depends on which ones. We picked up Orchard View because the VFW on, on the hill, they were forced to close. One thing about VFW is everybody used to say they're their old boys club, a bar. We do have a canteen. It's like a sword, it's sharp on both sides. You have to sort of balance between that. The VFW's got a lot of strict rules and programs you have to follow. Uh, I've been real honored for 23 years to be the commander of that VFW. Like everybody says, why do you do it? And I says, well, I probably bend some other arms, but it's been my life. I just love doing it. I'm retired military, civil service, and for what the, as long as the government doesn't go broke, I'm financially set. <laughs> I hope not anyway. I know a lot of us are probably in that boat. But uh, the post has did extremely well in the last 20 some years. This white hat I'm wearing is a symbol of the post that this year was in the top 5% of the 280 posts in the state of Michigan. We've been recognized 14 out of the last 25 years of being the top 5%. Three of them years, we was in the top 5% of the whole Veterans of Foreign Wars, wow. which is 6,000 posts, not just the United States, they're in Europe, South America, Latin America, with a million members. We do the stuff that's required, we help the communities, we help the veterans and everything like that there. But uh, in our little community, backs us 100%. Like I say, when we have that free dinner, there's usually one or two of the township people that, that work it with us. Because they got to get the count to tell the senior, source, senior resources, okay, they had that many, put money in the bank so Billy can pay his bills. <laughs> and, uh, but it's a lot of fun, you know, we've, our membership's been up and down. Last month I've lost four members, two in their 90s. We have one member, 97. Uh, the original 83, as far as I know, none are living. Mm -hmm. Which we've lost, we've lost, you know, a couple of them in the last few years. Last year we had 18 members pass away. Mm -hmm. For years with the County Council Honor Guard, I did a lot of funerals, like with Bob. But it got to the point, I just couldn't go up and give a flag as a post commander to another widow of another one of my members. Because I did that probably 250 times. It just it gets to you after a while. And I, I commend the County Council Honor Guard. They do 150, maybe more funerals a year. Because, you know, we're losing or not just World War II. A lot of people my age, and I'm 75 Vietnam vets, we're burying a lot of them. A lot of recompensation due to Agent Orange exposure and even some from the Gulf. I've lost three of my members because of lung problems because of the burn pits, the stuff Michael talked about next month. So like I say, that's it's actually my home away from home. And if you know we have a canteen or anybody wants to stop out after two o'clock, we open two nine during the week and it's a nice little place. We have a few of them nice legal gambling machines. <laughs> Paul Tension, I got them nudge masters. Everybody says, well, I need I get a credit card. I said, credit cards will work every place, except for you can't get money out. 
And I know it saves me driving 100 miles that way or 80 miles that way. And the money does come back into the VFW. You know, like last week, our auxiliary did Texas Hold'em over the Northway bowling alley. This week, the Post is doing it. Yeah, it's four days, but you can do four days and bring in three or $4,000 to the club. Beat the heck out of cooking hamburgers. <laughs> I did that for a lot of years. I do a lot of cooking out there. I just love doing it. And being a bachelor, somebody says, how do you learn to cook? I say, you got to survive, you know. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions about the, the VFW out there or anything else or myself? I'd like to ask a question if that's all right. I think a lot of what you guys probably try to do is what we do and share with people who maybe don't have a lot of military history knowledge. I imagine over the years you've had several people come through with some very interesting experiences that to share with whether you're going into schools or with everybody. Are there maybe a few of the military stories that you can think of from members of your VFW that you think people should know about that maybe they don't? Because I mean, the war is not all just the, the big dates and timelines and everything. It's the individuals that make up all that effort. So do you, you know, have a lot of stories to share? Yeah, like a lot of them. And like, uh, the gentleman she talked about earlier, Joe, was not a member of our post, but his daughter, Mrs. Sugar, was a school teacher at Oak Ridge. She always made sure we had DVD. And Joe was out, I've got a couple copies of the book. Interesting gentleman sat down with one of our members I referred to a few minutes ago that's out past, Ken Munson Sr. Here about 15 years ago, we was talking about, you know, and I knew he was a POW in World War II. And he says, yeah, he was talking about this, but he kept talking about, yeah, he said they fixed my foot. And about a month later, he was in, I seen he had his foot bandaged. I said, why? And he says, well, you know, when they sewed me up over there, they just took some old thread. Fifty years later, that thread came out. Wow. But they said they did take care of him. You talk to a lot of the troops that have been, especially a lot of the ones that just came back, because I've been real active in the military assistance program with the state of Michigan, and for 10 years I was on a committee out of Kansas City with National VFW. And with troops coming back, trying to get them care and stuff, you know, like a National Guard I Reserve, they come back, go to Fort McCoy, they says, okay, you got a broken back, goodbye, go see the VA. Mm -hmm. Working with them, you know, it's been good. In fact, Senator Stavanoff, I think, think for a while she think I had her on speed dial in her office because she helped out a lot of our veterans. You talk with troops, all oh, they're in different areas of the world, or like when people are in Vietnam and Thailand, they go to different other countries when they're R and R's. The last wars over there, people didn't get R and R's. I've got several of my troops, I know they go over nine months later. They lost thirty percent of their body weight. Guess what? They bring them back, fatten them up, and send them back over again. I've got people who spent 10 years in the military, spent six tours over there. But 90% of them, even some of them that were injured or everything else, I'd say 80% yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't change it. It's, it's a life experience. You meet a lot of people, sometimes you travel around the world, you see a lot of places, you wouldn't if you want to work, you know, or the factory or someplace around here. The camaraderie between you and your people is great. I know people that leave and go all over the United States to have conventions, reunions with people from Vietnam. We did have from Korea, but now they're not doing it anymore. But a lot of them, like I say, they enjoyed it. A lot of them have fell in love all around the world and everything else. And I get a good sense a lot of people, time when I have people come in and say, well, sorry, I couldn't go. I've got this, I've got that. You know, it just wasn't your, your, your thing to do. I enlisted in the Air Force. Yeah, I could be a gen engine mechanic. I hate to say how many bombs I built to put on B-52s. But just, you know, you don't get the job you want. But the seven and a half years I spent active, I, I enjoyed it. Then I spent another 17 years with the Michigan Army and National Guard, which I really enjoyed. Especially when I worked full time. They kept me out, kept me busy, and the next day it was something different. But we worked even with the National Guard, we worked with a lot of 
communities and doing different things for them. So my experience has been 100% positive. But uh, every so while you'll hear, you'll hear some good stories. That we sort of, if they sit at the club room too long and it gets a little un, my bartender says, okay, that's it, they're done, you know. But sometimes you have to do that. There's a lot of veterans out there my age, a lot of them are just realizing they have post-traumatic stress. And now the VA is really pushing to fix them and the people that came back in Afghanistan and stuff. Because like I say, everybody says war is hell. Anything else? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, what's the uh, uh, requirements for membership in the VFW? You have to serve in a combat zone. Or you have to be uh, some place where you receive an intimate danger pay, hostile uh, pay. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, actually, I had a, a guy that was a uh, Marine in D.C. He was getting hazardous duty pay because he guarded the president. That makes the qualifications. If you were in Korea, even yesterday, you qualify for the veterans of foreign wars. Mm -hmm. That has never been a close conflict. It's still a conflict. Embassy guards require, we do have an auxiliary, which used to be at one time a ladies auxiliary. 15 years ago, they started the men's auxiliary because we used to have the sons. Five years ago, they combined them. I have got a lot of male that are in the auxiliary now. And a lot of them are, I got one of us, a 20-year veteran, never left the United States. Mm. By keeping our membership up, which we strive, one of the reasons to get one of these white hats or get the post recognized, you have to be 100%. Now, last year, losing 18 members to death, we weren't 100%. Our year runs from July to June. We're at 100% already this year because we pushed and got more members. Uh, it's a great organization. It's actually the biggest combat organization. Yes, the American Legion has got more people. An American Legion, if you were in the service all the way back for the last 50 years, you can join now. Uh, you know, like I say, it's just women. I joined it back in 1969. Of course, I belonged to VFW, the DVA, the Vietnam Vets, plus, you know, that's the American Legion. So I get mail from everyone. I want a donation from this. It gets you on everybody's email list, I'll tell you. But, uh, the more people we have, the more clout we have in D.C. I can't remember the guy's name. He's out of Detroit. You see him around at state meetings. I seen him here a couple weeks ago in Flint. He wears an oxygen machine. He was on TV when they were pushing for the PAC Act, the deal for the burn pits. And our convention, there was a picture there of him standing next to the President of the United States when they signed that PAC Act. He was really instrumental. Our national reps from Michigan and uh, several states were canvassed by the VFW from the state of Michigan. I know I went to Ohio with a group and we've got 95% of the senators and congressmen in this area completely voted that thing through which that's helped with the deal from the Marine Corps deal down south, plus the burn pits over in Afghanistan and Iraq and stuff like that there. But uh, it's us pushing the politicians. Because you know how it is, they go, well, what's in it for me? Sometimes I like to slap someone. Because <laughs> for years I used to, go to, used to go to D.C. in March with my national commitment and sat down with our senators and our congressmen explain this is what we're looking for. Our national commander goes there several times a year. Because like I say, they're the ones that hold, hold the purse strings. Anything else, everybody? Yes, sir. Can you tell us more about Derzinski? He was in the Navy. Yep. And he was... Science of the Marine Expeditionary Force yeah. in the Pacific. Before he went over there, I heard from one person told me that some relative told him that he did work with the 
like the draft board when they used to do physicals in Muskegon. Plus, he had a practice. Like I say, that's when Mr. Thompson and him met before overseas. So then he fixed up Thompson over there. But when he came back, he started his practice again and uh, worked real hard on the fire department. But then by working at actually at Hackley Hospital, this is what the article I read said is where he came down with diabetes or with excuse me polio and passed from it. Which you know probably back then I didn't know much was born because I was born in '47. So so was his son Jimmy. And uh, but uh, I tried to find it on Google and stuff. In fact, some of the articles I've got an article that come out of the paper about that large that I've got framed at the VFW on them. And there's an article underneath Eggleston Township. I think it says East Side Muskegon. There's some articles in there about him and, and his family, along with look on the few other ones that were originally, you know, 50, 60 years ago, and Eggleston got really formed out there. Well, you know Jim. Then. Jimmy? Oh yeah. In fact, I talked to him about an hour or so ago. Okay. You yeah, know, he's he went, he's a member. He went through grief in Vietnam. Yeah, he uh, he's having a lot of problems. Which I'll tell you a lot of them. I've got quite a few of them. I agree now I've got six of my Vietnam vets that are in nursing homes or something like that. And I, I visit them when I can. Well, he's still carrying shrapnel. Mm -hmm. And Problems with Agent Orange. Yeah, yeah, I, found, I jumped on him for a long time by getting that checked out, and he finally did. Because I said, there, you know, you got to be evaluated. I've had veterans sent in there that says, well, I don't need it. It isn't ID, you need it. So ID, you're entitled to it. I said in the briefing out in DC, I don't know how many years ago, and General Schwarzkopf was one of our speakers at an auditorium quite a bit bigger than this here. He said, one thing about going into service, you weren't treated real well, you sure now weren't paid well. The VA's payback time. Don't be afraid to talk to them. Yes, for a lot of years, the VA, that, nah, forget about that. Mm -hmm. Mike and the later that, you know, being the way our vet center Muskegon works now, I'm real proud. In fact, I'm on the advisory committee for that. I'm the chairman this year. And working with Mike and Annette and Dave and them down there and looking at the reports, people are getting help and the amount of money that people are recovering because of something that happened in the service. And you don't know until you apply. Don't sit back there and say well, like this. And I've had people say, well, we tried for years. We had tried to do this. I sat at a meeting a month ago down at Flint where a lady's husband passed away from diabetes. And everything Agent Orange, same thing I've got. He was in Thailand, but he wasn't at the air bases where I was, where I was exposed. Now with the PAC Act, the whole country in Thailand is incorporated. Her husband had died, but she checked out to a VSO, and guess what? She made the get compensation even though he has passed. There, there's a lot of stuff. This PAC Act, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of pages it is, was a miracle for veterans. And like I say, in the last 20 years of being real active with different, the VA and the Vet Center and all through the VFW, the United States is finally starting to step up. Yet, yeah, we're not getting 100% taken care of. Some people are just too damn stubborn. Guy says, well, I got this. I said, why did you go down? You know, you got to go down. I hate, I've had put people in the car and take them down and get them signed up. Well, they don't want to answer these questions. So I says, you do if you want to get anything. Don't think about it you. I said, you're getting a certain percentage. If you pass, if you're 100% your wife may be getting taken care of. You know, you, just, you, you got to know. And like I say, the people down here at our vet center are good as gold in my and Mike knows that I'm on the phone to him all the time. <laughs> How about this? Or I get a text back. Well, you got to look at this. Well, you got to take care of the veterans because they took care of us. They allowed us to be in this zoo we're having right now. 
which tomorrow there is voting. Uh, God, maybe I get my TV back. <laughs> Anybody else? Because like Mike said, I, what I get, I better get because the loopy gets up there. Mm -hmm. I'll be serving popcorn. <laughs> Besides that, Loop, Loopy is a member of 7729. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Billy. Um, we have the, 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 just the pleasure and honor of having okay. the current chair of our Veterans Advisory Committee and a previous chair of our Veterans Advisory Committee. So both very active in the veteran community. Um, thank you for both of what you do. All right, Ms. Yeldiar. Good evening, Mr. No, I, I hope you can hear me. I've got a handout being passed around, and I may not stay in that same format, but I have enough people in here who were or are members of Chapter 31 that can give me a hand. I happen to have the current president here and one of the very a third president here uh, with me, plus one of the main authors of Chapter 31. So if, I, if you can bear with me, I'm going to try and go through 40 years of what you're hearing now that's happening, the good things are happening. I'd almost like to take credit for Vietnam Veterans of America for accomplishing those things that happened. That was a very rough time in the 60s. Uh, everything was up in the air. We went from Pat Boone to clear, clear water revival and nothing flat. Uh, Everything was just up in the air. We didn't know what PTSD was. We didn't know what Agent Orange was. We didn't know what any of those things were. But we had veterans who had these problems. We had veterans that were unemployed because at that time, Muskegon was making a transition from iron factories the camel wine cannons, the seal powers, and all the other iron manufacturers in the area that were providing Detroit with the products for the vehicles. That was going down the tube at that time. Everything was turning into lightweight aluminum. We weren't prepared. We didn't make the adjustment. So there was a hell of a lot of turbulence at that time. There was an ad at that time, nationally, Vietnam Veterans of America was starting to form up. Our number is chapter 31. We are the 31st chapter in all of Vietnam Veterans of America. It wasn't a big organization. Today it's not a big organization. But I think it's a hard working organization. We're not like the VFW and DAV who's been around for years, but we have 650 chapters right now in all 50 states. <coughs> yeah, we only have 90,000 members. But I'd like to think that those other chapters in the rest of the country are just as good as ours, or ours has been. I'm 75 years old like Billy, just like Jim Derasinski, that is the average age of the Vietnam veteran. I've been fortunate uh, in those 75 years, my last tour in the Marine Corps after I left Vietnam was to work in a uh, personnel administrator to help veterans solve issues with pay and <coughs> promotions and transfers and things like that. And I come back retired uh, with disability. I come back to Michigan and I got a job with the Michigan Employment Security Commission with John Morgan there. And uh, my job was to help veterans find jobs. And that was all right when I first got back. 
unemployment wasn't too bad. It was five, six percent at that time when I come back. But it quickly turned up into that point of 23 percent. We had Vietnam veterans unemployed all over. And they were confused. They really were. It was a tough time. Think of all the other veterans or veterans in previous wars. They had time to work off the issues. They got on a boat and left Europe. They got on a boat and left the Pacific. They had that 30 days to maybe talk amongst themselves, maybe to work some things out, but they had time to work from the war, from the war effort, the bad things that happened. <coughs> I've got a man sitting right over here in the corner that signed the authorization for people to get on the plane to come back. Because I know some people here in Michigan, Dennis authorized for them to get on the plane and come back home. 24 hours later, they were home. 24 hours later, they didn't have time. And what did they come back to? Mm -hmm. You couldn't talk to anybody about the Vietnam War. I don't want to hear that, I know what it's all about. They heard it all on NBC, they heard it all on ABC, and they heard it all on CBS. They told you what the war was. My dad wrote me a letter all the time. My dad told me, I know where you're at because a special marine unit was going a certain place at a certain time. I was in that unit, but Dad could tell through the chronicle where we were going. So I couldn't talk to people about Vietnam. I don't think Dennis could either, or anybody else involved in that war. Don't tell me I know. I know exactly what's going on over there. So we had a troubled group of people. Very troubled. Because again, nobody had identified PTSD, nobody had identified Agent Orange. But we knew there were problems coming up. We started hearing about the victims of Agent Orange, the tremendous amount of cancers we had some squads or platoons, multiple people in the same unit dying of cancer. Just unheard of. It started going on TV. So these things, these issues were starting to come up. And about that time, there was an ad in the Muskegon Chronicle asking Vietnam veterans if they wanted to form. Dennis is one of the founding members, Dr. Cobbler over here. 30 people gathered and they decided to create what we call Vietnam Veterans America Chapter 31. We, and I say we, but they, because I didn't join until uh, 83. They formed and, and were chartered in 1982. We had to, we found a, finally found a place to start meeting at in the old fire barn in downtown Muskegon. We grew up to 250 members. That, we were hanging off the walls at meeting places. But the things that those men achieved were unreal. I hear about all, uh, like I said, all the good things Mike's doing. I don't know how many people know that Vietnam Veterans of America helped create the Vet Center. When I first came back to Muskegon, the Vet Center was open three times a week. And there was an 80-year-old lady down there named Eno, Emma, wonderful lady. Absolutely wonderful lady. If you were in dire need and you were eligible, she helped get you the money to take care of that need. 
But how many people knew of that? You go down to the county building three times a week? Not good. We were working hard on, at that time, starting on the Agent Orange issue was there. Now the PTSD. Nobody had really identified PTSD yet. It was just starting to get identified, and thanks to John Morgan here and Dr. Cobbler, we worked with uh, the county to develop a vet center downtown on Clay Street. We operated that vet center for three years. There we brought attorneys in to help people file claims. We brought in counselors from Grand Rapids. We brought in counselors from the Skeeting County Mental Health Department to aid the veterans that were having problems. At that time, the chapter created rap groups. We had so many rap groups, I don't know if anybody here can name them all. We had veterans rap groups. We had marriage rap groups. We had single, I think, single parents rap groups. Dennis or Dale, free, John, feel free to help me. Couples, we had couples a, rap group. I, couples rap group. Couples rap groups. I mean, we were doing everything we could to help Vietnam veterans adjust to society here in Muskegon. So we went on, we kept going and going. Because that we held on to that vet center for three years. Basically we got we struck out. What we didn't know was we had government funding to create that vet center. Once community mental health has that funding for three years in a row. They can do anything they want with it. So they literally shut the doors on us. I mean, they took our shovels. They took our chairs. They took our TV. I mean, uh, I got on the phone, and I was after that administrator. I said, you know, you got our TV. We paid for it. You got our snow shovels. What the hell are we going to do? What are you going to do with them? I was really upset. But I think if you remember, they took everything. We moved down on Cheers. Sanford, mm -hmm. right on the corner there, downtown. Out of our own pockets, out of our chapter funds, we kept the vet center going. We kept the vet center going. Mm -hmm. So we had what we call you, the VFW and DAV, American Legion, they call them service officers. We call them service reps, service representatives. That's what they were. They represented you to the VA. They weren't officers. None of us were officers. We didn't have any commanders, vice commanders, third vice commanders. We had a president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, and board of directors. We were a typical nonprofit. So we had a, we kept this vet center going as long as our funds could hang out. At that time, HBO, and this was years ago, years ago, HBO decided to run a special fundraiser nationwide for Vietnam veterans of in initiatives. Whatever you wanted to write for, submit it, and if we like it, we'll approve it. Only two applications from any Vietnam Veterans of America chapter got approved. This guy right here wrote them both. One was for $100,000 to establish our own vet center, and that's basically where Mr. Dave Ewing got hired to begin with. And the other one was $100,000 to hire Dennis Cobbler to get us five more 
in the state of Michigan. Escanaba, Traverse City, Marquette. Um, we got five more vet centers going. The two grants we got from HBO were unreal. And I even skipped over the probably, <coughs> I talked earlier about the 23% unemployment we had here, Ms. Keegan. We, John and I, got together with the leadership of our State Michigan Employment Security Commission and with uh, Mickey Knight. Mickey Knight. Got together with Mickey Knight and we proposed because at that time President Reagan gave authorization for any Vietnam veteran. Once you got out, you had 10 years to spend your GI Bill or you didn't get it. So this was after the 10 years had expired since the war ended. And a lot of people did not even touch your GI Bill. This went to work for a factory and that was it. President Reagan gave authority, a limited authority, to use that GI Bill. Chapter 31, when I say chapter 31, John Morgan, but the rest of the chapter got in. We got uh, hooked up with Mickey Knight because we knew there was some federal funding coming down the road. It was called CETA at that time. Uh, the very initial funding the very, very first funds that were distributed went to the UAW, to General Motors, and to Muskegon Chapter 31. And you're talking about 12 to 15 million dollars that we brought into Muskegon so that Vietnam veterans could go to school to learn how to be welders, to learn how to be machine operators, to learn how to be uh, financial keepers. We trained them in the areas they needed to be trained. And guess what? They got to keep the GI Bill. Because we paid, through that grant, we paid for their schooling. So the veterans that applied, it was like two, almost 300 of them. I think it was 283 or something like that, John. Mm -hmm. It's almost 300 of them. And we brought all this money to Muskegon. Multi-billions of dollars to help Vietnam veterans. These are all things that are being done now by Mike. But believe me, before there was a Mike Ball, before there was a Veterans Service Center, we helped create create all of these good things that happen in the community. Vietnam Veterans of America, you did not have to be a Vietnam veteran to join. We felt that anybody who served during that time period, we never heard of a World War II vet and a non-World War II vet. My dad was a World War II vet. He spent his entire time in Hawaii, fortunately, from 1942 forward, but he never saw the Pacific campaign. Everybody calls him a World War II vet. He was a World War II vet. But we realized at that time that there were veterans, Air Force veterans, in Texas handling Agent Orange and packaging it and sorting it before any of us knew what Agent Orange was. They're just as much Vietnam veterans as we are. We even accepted people in the prison. And you know why? They were veterans before they were prisoners. 
They were incarcerated. We, we chose to go out there and visit with them. And we had large groups. And they wound up doing some great projects. Matter of fact, inside the prison, they, we loaned them the money to buy some huge uh, freezers. And they turned that in with their own money to buy ice cream and sell to other prisoners. And that thing was so popular, when we decided to put up our memorial, which is on the cover sheet of that, when I passed out, final approach, they donated $10,000 out of the prison <coughs> to our memorial, which is another thing I take great pride in. We raised over $75,000 to build our memorial, final approach, out on the, out on the uh, south side of town there. But on the north side of town, we were, we helped with, we organized with the North Side Alliance to put on that 75 year anniversary of the causeway. We knew what was hurting out there because we did all these projects around the causeway, but we always had to depend on one end because there was no electricity in the place. So we saw that as an issue, and we were the very first organization. We donated a ton of money to the North Side Alliance, and we worked together, and guess what happened? We got brand new lights all through the park. We got sidewalk all the way around the park. That went on to the whole south side of the park being done later on through Wednesday. So we started that whole thing in motion. And it's still going on today. There's still, we're still waiting, hopefully, on some more improvements. I don't want to ever forget that park. I probably won't be around, but in another 12 years, Michigan's most beautiful mile will be 100 years old. Created in 1935. Where we're sitting right now in this building, in this building, we were the very first organization to make a donation to the board of the Silver Sides so that they could build we donated 5000 and that's barely what we had in our treasury at that time. We barely had $5,000. And we gave it to the Silver Sides to start this museum. We were the very first ones. So I know a lot of this is, I just want to let you know that I'm very proud of Vietnam Veterans of America. I don't know how many people really know that some of the things that we see here today, and I can mention final approach over Norton Shores, the causeway, the work we've done there, the Silver Sides, my dad, the vet center. We were putting up homeless people the very first time we opened up the vet center. We had that floor above where Mike is, with homeless veterans in there. So we've gone a long way, and we've done a lot of things, and I've probably forgotten a thousand things. We brought uh, three years in a row. In 84, 85, 86, we held a state picnic here in Muskegon. We brought uh, first year, just a little over 2,000. Then the next time, next year, about 2,300. And the last time, it was over 2,500. 2,500 Vietnam veterans and their families from all over Michigan, that's in the Upper Peninsula, the eastern side of the state. They all traveled to Muskegon, stayed in our hotels, bought our gas here. 
a lot of money was spent in Muskegon because of us. All the grant money we got came to Muskegon to spend in this town. So I'm very proud of all the accomplishments. And again, I want to pe thank people like Dennis, John, Dale, you're the current president, and you've lived through most of this. Mm -hmm. uh, does anybody have any questions about the Veterans Club? I just think that everybody needs to know that a lot of people didn't, didn't even know we existed or still exist. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I'm not a native of Muskegon, but I've lived here now about 12 years. And this sounds like a really ignorant question. But you all keep referring to the Vet Center. I don't know what or where that is. Is that a physical place? Yes, downtown the Muskegon. Downtown? Downtown uh, in the old Baker College building. I guess I don't know what that is, see? OK, it's it's almost kitty corner to the county building. I can find it there. So we are located um, in the county complex on uh, Apple and Pine, oh. down by the jail. And we occupy the second floor of the building that says it's numbered 165, and it has uh, veteran services on it. The third floor and the first floor are occupied by Family Division for Public Defenders. Is that the multi-story building? The there's there's a couple of us. That dominates the, the corner? Yeah, there's yeah. a couple of us, yep. No, the, the one that's on the corner is HR pretty much, and part of Health West. We're inside the big the big uh, parking lot right by the treasurer's office. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. But again, a lot, and, and believe me, just exactly like Billy said, and I'm one of Billy's members, uh, I got him to sign up with Vietnam Better of America, and I signed up with his VFW post, and uh, tons of good members we've had in there. But all these services are being done today at a terrific rate. Back then they weren't. Like I said, it was a gal in her 80s working three days a week. There weren't any legal services being promoted. There weren't any other uh, mental health services being promoted. All these things Mike is doing at a, at a great, great superior to, to the rest of the, the vet centers that are throughout the state. You mentioned at the beginning of your your presentation that when you came back, a lot of people weren't interested in hearing about Vietnam. Do you find that it's changed that people do want to be educated about what happened in Vietnam, what Vietnam veterans went through there, here, not only through adult groups like this, but do the schools ever invite you in to educate them? What's so neat today, uh, what today is, is to, to look at all the, I'm, I'm a proud Vietnam veteran. Now all of a sudden those hats appear. Uh, John and I both are aware of this, but we would see the veterans coming into the unemployment office and those mysterious dates that were left off the resumes. People didn't want to put on the resumes that they were in, in service during the Vietnam era. They left them off because nobody was proud of being a Vietnam veteran. So if I could add something to that. Back in the day, we did do educational programs mm -hmm. at the schools. Uh, the problem with it is, of course, is that history happens to you. And, you know, Vietnam is now getting to be 50 years ago. And so today's kids are not that interested anymore. If I think of maybe if you ask them about Ukraine, they could probably tell you something. But I think if you ask them about Vietnam, they wouldn't really have a clue because that's history. That's for old people. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we are one. <laughs> you know? Well, sooner or later. Sooner or later, <laughs> yeah. Creep on up on us anyway. And, and, the one, and the one last point i got to make is that, unfortunately, we are a last man standing organization. Our charter, which was congressionally approved, uh, states that anybody who served from 59 to 75 is eligible to be a member. Uh, we tried to order that and allow that new generation of veterans to come in and we would support them and 
IRS said, no way. You agreed to your charter. So uh, we are a last man standing organization. I don't even know how many more days I'll sit down, let alone stand up. So, uh, but we worked hard, and I think uh, all of us have taken pride in the things that are happening nowadays because a lot of the work that we did. And I'm very proud of that work. Mm -hmm. very yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you both so much for sharing. I mean, we not have, we don't get enough time to focus on the local people from Muskegon. There's a lot of heroes right there. Whoa, 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 whoa.